Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about propositions 14 through 17 in Proclus' Elements of Theology. And this video is part of a series of videos on the elements of theology. And as I have been doing throughout this series, I am using the E.R. Dodds translation. And as always, for those of you who don't have the text, I will put a link in the description box to a PDF version. So today we're going to be starting a section of the text that E.R. Dodds labeled on the grades of reality. And we're going to start by looking at what is moved versus what is unmoved. And so proposition 14, all that exists is either moved or it's unmoved. And if the former, either, meaning if it's moved, then it's either moved by itself or moved by another. That is either intrinsically or extrinsically. So that everything is unmoved, intrinsically moved or extrinsically moved. So we have three different categories and he's going to rank them for us. So since there are things which are extrinsically moved, moved from outside themselves, it follows that there is also something that is unmoved and an intermediate existence, which is self-moved. So the way he's ranking it is unmoved, self-moved, and then extrinsically moved. And he's going to explain why. So here's how he makes his case. Suppose that all extrinsic movement derived from an agent which is itself in motion. Then we have either a circuit of communicated movement, which is like that limited circle that we saw last time with Proposition 11, or we have an infinite regress, which is also what we saw in Proposition 11. But we already saw that neither of these is possible in as much as the sum of existence is limited by a first principle. And again, that was, that's a summary of Proposition 11. We also saw in Proposition 7 that the mover is superior to the moved. The cause is superior to its effect. And if the effect is movement, then the cause, that which moves it, the cause of that movement, the mover, must be superior to that which it moves. There must, therefore, be something unmoved, which is the first mover. In other words, if you're always imagining something that moves, that is moving something outside of itself, um, moving this pencil, for example, my hand is moving this pencil, so the pencil is extrinsically moved. If you imagine that everything that can move something is itself moved by something, then you will go on to infinity, which we already saw is impossible. There must be a first cause, and that, he's saying, must be unmoved. But if so, there must also be something that is self-moved. Now we have to see why does he think there has to be a self-moved. The first thing to participate in movement is what he's calling self-moved. We're going to see here that the logic is quite similar to the logic that he used to argue for self-sufficiency, that the first thing to participate in the good is the self-sufficient. It's close enough in power that it can generate its, um, its goodness within itself because it's so close to the good, yet it's still ultimately participating in the good. And we're going to see the same for the self-moved, that it is ultimately participating in the unmoved, but it is generating movement within itself. For imagine all things to be at rest. So if you only have the unmoved, what will be the first thing set in motion? Well, not the unmoved by the law of its nature, by its very name, actually, and not the extrinsically moved, since its motion is communicated from without, from something outside itself. It remains, then, that the first thing set in motion would be the self-moved, which is, in fact, the link between the unmoved and the things which are moved extrinsically. At once, mover and moved, the self-moved is a kind of mean term between the unmoved mover and that which is merely moved. Everything which exists, therefore, is either unmoved, intrinsically moved, moving from itself, or extrinsically moved, moving, being moved by something outside of itself. 
And then he has one additional point here that from this it is apparent also that of the things moved, the self moved has primacy. So between the self moved and that which is moved by something outside of itself, the self moved has prim primacy. Now the self moved is both a mover and the moved. So as moved, it has primacy, but as a mover, primacy goes to the unmoved. Okay, it is um, subordinate to the unmoved. Now this one can be very difficult to see. Um, I do have a video that focuses just on the, um, the metaphysics behind this whole idea of motion, the hypostases of motion. And I did pull from sources other than the elements of theology. So you can see it from some other perspectives perhaps or looking at it you know, from another angle. So you may find that helpful if this is confusing to you. And so I will link that video at the end. And now he goes on to what seems at first like he's changing the subject. He says, all that is capable of reverting upon itself is incorporeal. This seems like it's unconnected to what he was just looking at in Proposition 14. By the time we get to Proposition 17, though, he is going to link them together. Okay, so let's take a look at what he says about reversion. All that is capable of reverting upon itself, he says, is incorporeal. For it is not the nature of any body to revert upon itself. So think of the symbol of a snake biting its own tail. So the mouth is biting the tail, two different parts of the snake that are connecting. The mouth is, we can say the snake is reverting on itself. It's certainly a symbol of reversion, but it's the mouth that is connecting to the tail. It's not the whole connecting to the whole. That which reverts upon anything is conjoined with that upon which it reverts. Hence, it is evident that every part of a body reverted upon itself must be conjoined with every other part. So that's what we mean by reversion, the whole reverting on the whole of itself. Since self-reversion is precisely the case in which the reverted subject and that upon which it has reverted become identical. Okay, again, the whole reverting on it, the whole of itself and becoming identical with it. So there's a definition of what he means by reversion. But this is impossible for a body and it's universally impossible for any divisible substance. For the whole of a divisible substance cannot be conjoined with the whole of itself because of the separation of its parts, which occupy different positions in space. And therefore, if a body cannot revert on itself, it means that nothing in the physical realm can revert on itself. Reversion takes place beyond the physical realm. It is not the nature then of any body to revert upon itself so that the whole is reverted upon the whole. Thus, if there is anything which is capable of reverting upon itself, it is incorporeal and without parts. Okay, so when we talk about reversion, we're talking about that which is beyond the realm of body. And now just to make it a little tighter, he's going to explain that all that is capable of reverting upon itself has an existence that is separable from body. So not only is it incorporeal, but it's also dis be able to disconnect itself or separate itself from body. And so the first point he's going to make is that if the existence is um, something that cannot separate from body, then the activity also cannot separate because something has to exist before it can do anything. So existence always rings higher. Okay, for if there were any body whatsoever from which it was inseparable in its existence, it could have no activity separable from the body, since it is impossible that if the existence be inseparable from bodies, the activity which proceeds from the existence, that activity always comes after existence, it exists and then it does something. So activity which proceeds from the existence could not be separable if the existence is inseparable. If so, the activity would be superior to the existence. If it were possible for the activity to be separable but not the existence, then the activity would be superior to the existence in that the latter needed a body while the former was self-sufficient, being dependent not on bodies but on itself. 
anything therefore which is inseparable in its existence is to the same or even greater degree inseparable in its activity okay so that point has been established now let's see what follows from that but if so it cannot revert upon itself for that which reverts upon itself must be other than body that's what we saw in proposition 15 and so it has an activity that is independent of the body reversion is an activity that bodies cannot do it is this activity is independent of the body and it's not conducted through the body or with the body's cooperation since neither the activity itself nor the end to which that activity is directed requires the body so reversion is something completely separate from anything that has that is connected to body accordingly that which reverts upon itself must be entirely separable from bodies okay so he had to explain this about reversion in order to make the point that he wants to make in proposition 17 so here is where he's going to connect the idea of self moving with reversion proposition 17 so everything else was really leading up to this one everything originally self moving is capable of reversion upon itself already off the bat we see that if this is true then whatever is self moving is incorporeal for if it moves itself, then its mode of activity is directed upon itself, and mover and moved exist simultaneously as one thing. Now, for this one, it may be helpful to just think of your own, um, your own philosophical practice, really, that when we are um, contemplating or we're meditating or we're contemplating what we're reading, which I hope you're doing with this text, as I've been encouraging you to do, we are turning it inward it's the soul is turning on itself reverting on itself so soul is an example of that which is self-moved both mover and moved and if you keep that example in mind this becomes much easier to understand for either it moves with one part of itself and it's moved in another um, that was like the example of the snake, for example, or the whole moves and is moved, or the whole originates motion, which occurs in a part, or vice versa, the part originates motion, which occurs in the whole. But if the mover be one part and the moved another, then in itself, the whole will not be self-moved, since it will be composed of parts which are not self-moved. It will have the appearance of a self-mover, but will not be such in essence. And as we go deeper into metaphysics, we start to consider the body to be an example of something that appears to be self-moved. Because certainly we're moving around, I'm talking, my lips are moving, I can move my hands. You're moving as well, holding your phone or whatever it is you're doing right now, but you can move and it seems like the body is moving. However, um, what we see in metaphysics is that it only the body has the appearance of being a self-mover. It's actually the soul that is moving the body, and the body is extrinsically moved. It is not a mover in its essence. Now, if the whole originates a motion which occurs in a part, or vice versa, there will be a part common to both which is simultaneously and in the same respect, both mover and moved. And it's this part which is originally self-moved. And in the human being, we would say that this part of us that is self-moved is the soul. So the soul is the self-mover and it moves the body. And you may think of your soul as a part of your body. If you think of your soul as being in the body, then you would think of it as a part, but it's the part that moves the body. And if one and the same thing both moves and is moved, it will, as a self-mover, have its activity of motion directed upon itself. But to direct activity upon anything is to turn towards that thing. So there's a definition of reversion. 
and everything, therefore, which is originally self-moving is capable of reversion upon itself. And this Proposition 17, then, is key to our metaphysics and to our very practice of educating the soul. So again, I will link a video at the end here for um, the hypostases of motion, and um, that will give you a little bit more um, to work with here because this has no examples or anything, and so it can be very hard sometimes maybe to, to visualize what he's talking about. If you do have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email. There's always an email address at the bottom of the description box, and also feel free to leave a comment or a question in the comment section as well. And as always, if you like what you're seeing, I would appreciate you hitting the like button. And also, if you don't already subscribe, I hope you will consider doing so. And hope to see, or hope you see me next time. Thank you very much.